If you go back and read the original source material, you might be in for a surprise. Welcome to Ms. Mojo, and today we're counting down our picks for the top 10 differences between the Sex and the City books and TV show. For this list, we're looking at the biggest ways the show diverged from the material it was adapting. If you like what you're hearing, be sure to check out the full song at the link below. My life's been trouble. Number 10. It's an essay collection. Were women in New York really giving up on love and throttling up on power? What a tempting thought. Perhaps the most important thing to know about Sex and the City, the book, is that it's not a novel but rather an essay collection. The book's author, Candace Bushnell, wrote a column for the New York Observer in the 90s, and the publication is an anthology of her work from that column. I explore these sorts of issues in my column, and I have terrific sources, my friends." This story will sound a little familiar to any fans of the show because, of course, Carrie Bradshaw is also a columnist. Bushnell has stated that Carrie is more of an alter ego than a representation of herself, which lets her be a little more candid with the events that take place in her columns, though much of it is taken directly from her real life. Sure, it'd be great to have that one special person to walk home with, but sometimes there's nothing better than meeting your single girlfriends for a night at the movies. Number 9. Being alone is more celebrated The oft-stated moral of Sex and the City, the TV show, is to work on your relationship with yourself. In fact, Carrie's final monologue of the series focuses on exactly that. But the most exciting, challenging, and significant relationship of all is the one you have with yourself. But the show's characters don't exactly practice what they preach. And by the end, all four women are comfortably partnered up. If you find someone to love the you, you love. The house is on the market. Look out, New York. I'm a coming. Well, that's just fabulous. The book is much more cynical about relationships, with Bushnell at one point stating, quote, relationships in New York are about detachment. The characters on the page are much less interested in settling down and truly embrace the single life in a more genuine way. Does it always have to be about them? Just, you know, give me a call when you're ready to talk about something besides men for a change. Number eight. The interviews are more important. It's like the riddle of the Sphinx. Why are there so many great unmarried women and no great unmarried men? Candace Bushnell's real-life columns occasionally featured real interviews with people on the topics of sex, relationships, and life in New York, which is likely what inspired the segments of the show where various characters break the fourth wall and speak directly into the camera. I think these women should just forget about marriage and have a good time. But if you've seen Sex and the City, you may have noticed that those man-on-the-street-style interviews quickly disappeared after featuring heavily in the first season. Most men are threatened by successful women. If you want to get these guys, you have to keep your mouth shut and play by the rules. This is likely because the show shifted to focus more specifically on the lives of Carrie and her three besties rather than a wider cast of characters. By the time you reach your mid-30s, you think, why should I settle? Number 7. Maturity is celebrated more in the book One of the ways that HBO's Sex and the City felt revolutionary is that it focused on women over the age of 30 who were unmarried and childless, at least when the series began. The longer I sat at that table, the more alone I felt, and it really hit me. I am 35 and alone. Aging is a big part of the characters' journeys on the show, but it's often looked at with a certain amount of anxiety. And I really, I hate myself a little for saying this, but... It felt really sad not to have a man in my life who cares about me." While there are plenty of episodes that celebrate aging and maturity, the book is even more confident and explicit about it, making aging seem like something to aspire to and something that one welcomed with grace rather than fear. Oh, let me see. When I was 22, he was about 30. Studio 54 was 79, so that would make him, what, 53. And that would make you... Number six. Carrie's friends are completely different. If you are single, there is one thing you should always take with you when you go out on a Saturday night. Your friends. This one may come as something of a shock, but in the book, Carrie has a large circle of friends and acquaintances, but does not have particularly close relationships with three female friends like she does on the show. And in fact, the Miranda, Charlotte, and Samantha that we've come to know and love on TV are practically unrecognizable on the page. Be damn sure before you get off the Ferris wheel because the women waiting to get on are 22, perky, and ruthless. 
You seem to have a lot of opinions today. Samantha is a film producer rather than working in PR. Miranda is a cable executive who loves doing cocaine. And Charlotte is British and basically addicted to sex. Bet you weren't expecting that one. I'm thinking about quitting my job. Did you get an offer from a better gallery? No, I mean stopping working. Altogether. Number 5. The book is darker. The tone of the show straddles the line between comedy and drama, but there is a heavy dose of lightheartedness that makes its way into every episode, no matter what more serious plot points might be taking place. The series tends to be fun and frothy, focusing heavily on fashion with plenty of shopping and shoe buying montages. But the book is decidedly darker, and the characters live in a much more real version of New York and address issues outside of themselves and their relationships. The world of the books is not a place for romantic comedy hijinks or happy endings. We've got to stop meeting like this. You've been waiting your whole life to say that. Number 4. Carrie gets a glimpse at a happy suburban ending. On the TV show, Carrie is perpetually chasing after the elusive Mr. Big, who seems as though he's always reluctant to settle down. Carrie, you're the one. We barely get to see them be in a relationship at all, because as soon as they're happy, conflict settles in. Kiss me a big cry, baby. In the book, there is a portion where Carrie goes to Mr. Big's house in Westchester, and she gets a taste of what suburban life with him would actually look like. I miss New York. Take me home. The event makes her question whether settling down with him is really what she wants. We do get a taste of this in the second Sex and the City movie, where Carrie and Big suffer from the boredom of being married and childless. Are you sure? It's gonna be just us two. Are we enough? Kid, we're too much. Number three, the characters address class. I spent $40,000 on shoes and I have no place to live? I will literally be the old woman who lived in her shoes. One of the major criticisms of Sex and the City, the television show, is the lack of intersectionality and a dominant whiteness. But interestingly enough, the book is much more self-aware about the characters' financial situations. It's like, when single men have a lot of money, it works to their advantage. But when a single woman has money, it's a problem you have to deal with. It's ridiculous. In the book, when Carrie received a mink coat as a gift from Mr. Big, it makes her recall a time not long before when she was living in near poverty, struggling to support herself. Big offered me the money for my down payment, but I could never take it. Could I? The basis in reality is that Bushnell herself was in fact evicted for failing to pay rent on one of her apartments. While the show does briefly try to address issues of class, it's a brief look, and the book delves deeper. So I can't tape it back. Number two, Carrie is less likable. I mean, really, why her? One of the major differences between the book and the show is that on the small screen, all four of our leading ladies are meant to be sympathetic characters. Even if they occasionally misstep, at the end of the day, we're supposed to love and relate to them. What about you, Lolita? Anything you do you wouldn't want Amanda to see? No. You know I believe her. In the book, however, Bushnell doesn't shy away from making Carrie and the rest of her crew totally despicable. Careful! Okay, damn, my ears? While on TV we're supposed to believe she always has good intentions, that's not the case on paper. Some may argue that Carrie isn't exactly likable in the series either, and we can't fully disagree. Please just shut up! I am so sick of hearing you talking, talking, talking all the time. Don't you ever just shut up? I'm gonna take a walk. No, 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 no. I'm taking a walk. Before we continue, be sure to subscribe to our channel and ring the bell to get notified about our latest videos. You have the option to be notified for occasional videos or all of them. If you're on your phone, make sure you go into your settings and switch on notifications. Number one, there's less physical intimacy. Well, uh, I'm not most women, so unzip and get over here. Considering the fact that nearly every episode of Sex and the City features a memorable lovemaking scene, you might be surprised to hear that despite being in the title, sex doesn't actually feature very heavily in the book. And when it does, it's hardly ever a positive thing, which we guess is a theme that runs through the show as well. But while the intercourse scenes in the series range from funny to sultry to romantic, like the rest of its content, the book gives a much darker take on the sex lives of single people, often being used as a way to simply avoid being alone. I think we should stop seeing each other. Why?
You're married. Do you agree with our picks? Let us know in the comments. And hey, if you're a fan of the song playing right now, be sure to check out the music video for it right here.